All right, zoom in a bit. I think I might go with this. Yeah, I'm just mumbling while I set up pro my set up my live stream. Sorry about that. But yes, we have a, a game between two Koreans. We have a game between, as you can see, Yi Cheng Ho versus Cho Cho Han. Two Korean players, so you might think we're going to see a game of, you know, scrambling for territory, a lot of fighting. But no, we're actually going to see a bit of an influential game. And what are you complaining about now? Quality resolution suggestion, I don't care, go away. Sorry, live stream was yelling at me. So yes, we're having a bit of a different game today. Uh, I hope you guys enjoy it. Now, these players you probably recognize, because as I mentioned a little bit ago, I actually went over these two players, the um, uh, my live stream channel. I went over these two players uh, lecture before last, though the players I think were reversed. I think uh, Yi Cheng Ho was white in that one. Here he's black. start up with a lot of lag and a rather uh, normal opening. We see Yi Cheng Ho decide to go ahead and approach. Could have seen many other things from him. He could have decided to go ahead and enclose, though we don't see that one as commonly nowadays. Could see micro and mini, or micro and low, sorry, uh, Chinese Fuseki. Those are somewhat common. The Chinese is extremely common nowadays. Everyone's playing it. Uh, professionally, that is. White has a few choices to make. Do you get territory? Do you pincer and start a fight? Do you completely ignore whatever black's doing and go ahead and approach a 3-4 stone? All of these are very fine ideas. And if you know how to use them, I would say that none are better than any other. However, Cho Chan decides he's just going to go ahead and simply play for territory, as you would expect from a Korean player. And this is where the game begins to get interesting, because although I'm sure we all know that the proper move here for black is to connect, or maybe to go ahead and play at uh, C14 for a very, very fast Fuseki, and I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, Yi Cheng Ho decides to go ahead and play the low Chinese. Why does he do that? He is leaving this cut point behind. Yes, it's already getting interesting. But this cut point, what do you guys think of it? Should white cut immediately? Should white do something else? What do you think? Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, what do we have? Uh, yeah, because that's something that I'll go ahead and actually show you now, uh, Amy Rose. Yeah, usually probably what you see is Black going ahead and, uh, for example, playing C14, trying to see if he can develop the left-hand side in a uh, faster fashion. If White backs off, for example, then he's getting a bit of a, a larger area here uh, for himself. The reason for that is because cutting is a little bit slow. If we go ahead and cut, and go through a variation like this, for example. Well, okay, black is still settling on the left-hand side, but white just got influence that he still has to use, and now because C14's been strengthened, we also kind of owe a move at F17 to make sure our corner doesn't get surrounded. So we're developing a little bit of a problem here. We can't take both of these points at once. So it seems that maybe Black's actually getting the upper hand. 
since he's taking one of our important points away with his next move. So yeah, typically white will not go ahead and play that, because there's uh, no real rush to do so. Instead, they typically either go ahead and back off, let him develop whatever he wants and invade it later, or sometimes, sometimes, uh, we'll go ahead and pick a huge fight here. But if this happens, you can be fairly certain that you'll see a variation similar to this one in which black strengthens himself and now white has to look after this one weak stone for the remainder of the game if he decides to actually uh, protect it. And there have been games like this too, it's playable. Here black took essentially a similar idea, only he built the framework on uh, the right hand side of the board, playing a uh, quick low Chinese Fuseki. And we could go ahead and see white cut. He doesn't. He goes ahead and takes a large point. Taking specifically um, black's ability to get an extension here ever again. He completely removes that uh, from black's options. If you were to go ahead and cut, we might even see black continue to go ahead and play elsewhere. Because if he keeps, if white, sorry, keeps playing these small moves on the left-hand side of the board, black's just going to keep developing. And now, sure, one, maybe two stones are dead, but that's small. Whereas black's framework is just growing way too quickly. And of course I say maybe two stones, because obviously... That stone's not quite dead yet. So, not uh, the right time to go ahead and cut that stone. That seems to be a little bit of a trap for black. Or for white, sorry. If you're a little bit too greedy and go after these stones, you might find yourself falling behind very, very quickly and being a little bit surprised by it. So instead, white takes a little bit of a larger point. Any guesses for black? Have a lot of options here. I mean, we can still go ahead and make very, very fast shape, for example, with uh, A, get some of that influence. If we get influence, maybe we can even go back and attack uh, D10 later. I'm sure there are other ideas as well. What do you guys think? What would you do? F4 for black. That is very, uh, very aggressive. Vacant Eyes still wants to expand. Understandable. We have a few other suggestions. F17. Where is F17? Oh, similar idea. You're looking to expand along the top. I see. Well, yes, black does decide to go ahead and play K4. Can anyone tell me why he played K4? Why K4 over a move like F17 or even K16? Why is he expanding uh, on the bottom purposefully? Anyone know? Something a bit more to that. We're getting very, very complicated. I like it when the answers turn complicated. Alright, vacant eyes. I like uh, that reasoning a lot. Sorry, well, I messed with my headset.
sitting on my head weirdly. Uh, I do like the idea of that uh, you are noticing that these stones are slowly being surrounded. Essentially what you're looking for is coming back and rescuing your stones. You've kind of given yourself a place to go. That's very nice. But more importantly, going really back to the very beginning of the low Chinese, or any Chinese really, micro, mini, whatever, it's uh, pretty much all centered around this 3-4 uh, point, trying to get your opponent to go ahead and approach uh, on in there, because if he does, lo and behold, he's pincered, it's your move, you can go around and just punch him around and get uh, territory for a while there. Fairly simple. Expanding along the bottom, again, begs the question of does white have to go ahead and approach uh, that corner to go ahead and make sure that black's territory doesn't grow out of control? So while he's doing that, staying true to his Fuseki, he's also threatening to revive his stones. Maybe, maybe even go ahead and uh, enclose white's corner. Whereas the top, take this away, take that away too, uh, whereas the top, it's a little bit easier to approach the top in terms of reduction. And I'll go ahead and show this right now, actually. I already played the move. Simply because we have no fear of actually approaching uh, in this particular fashion to uh, Black's 4-4 point, given that the triangled stone is so far away. Even if Black kicks us, we can still get a little bit of a two-space extension. The beginnings of a very nice base here. If that stone was closer, it would be a little bit harder. We couldn't get a two-space extension. We could only get a one-space. Not really going to live from that too well. It's more of a struggle. If, for example, uh, it was more of this situation, then, yeah, we uh, find ourselves with a very, very cramped base, very uncomfortable. But not so much the case over here. And we know that black's probably not going to pincer us, because we can go ahead and change directions and isolate K16, or maybe we could go ahead and just dive into the corner and get Sente. So that also makes it easy to go ahead and approach and live. So a few very basic reasons why Black decided to go ahead and expand from the bottom as he did. Uh, true, but it's important to know why it's more boring for black than it is for than the, the top side. Because that really goes back to the very basics of uh, the Chinese Fuseki, which is being used here. Of course, now that the bottom has been taken, the top side does become more interesting now. Because we don't have any large expansions along the bottom, they've already been taken. So for white, it's becoming more interesting, which is why we see him go ahead and approach. Hmm, one second. Sorry about that. But that again, what? Sorry, I got an error message. But again, that begs the question of how is black going to respond here? Is black going to simply go ahead and pull back? I should not have clicked that. Is black going to go ahead and pull back and allow white to uh, expand along the top? Is black going to go ahead and maybe pincer instead? I mean, what is black going to do? Because if we back off here, which I already clicked on, then white can continue expanding or white could go ahead and continue uh, taking territory. B is going to try and get Sente. Could. So you are not in favor of the tight pincer then, Dasan? Hmm. Is anyone in favor of the tight pincer? Anyone in favor of this? Well, actually, let's make that a bit more interesting. Dope. Oh. 
There we go. Anyone in favor of potential pincer? Yes, no, maybe. Oh, we have a uh, 12Q saying that uh, they're in favor of the pincer. All right, like two space pincers. Um, for black. I was wondering if anyone uh, wanted to go ahead and uh, not back off and get Tente, but uh, try to pincer in some fashion for black instead. Mm. Well, I do not like this variation. Or this variation, for that matter. For black. And one reason why I simply don't like it is because of this little low stone. If we were playing high Chinese, I might like it. But I don't like having so many ways for white to go ahead and reduce this. Plus, since I know this variation, I also know that it's very, very problematic for white to also get a stone around D. It's going to be Sente, otherwise he can go ahead and connect up underneath. That's not fun. Not fun at all. So we have a lot of forcing moves here to go ahead and try to reduce this. Since it's white's turn, we might even see that immediately. But, as Dasan says, he went ahead and got Sente, and he's using his framework. Because this is a very nice relationship with his stones. Bit of an enclosure, bit of an extension, still works well with the 3-4 uh, stone on the bottom. Everything here is still uh, working very, very nicely. And he's not being greedy. So, white goes for territory. Black decides to approach. Now, he could have blocked and then approached, but his choices are limited at this point. Because now we might just see black being severely attacked. And if white's getting influence here by putting pressure on this group, well, the more influence white gets, the less this uh, framework of blacks is going to be very useful. So this is just going to go ahead and hurt uh, black's global position. Can black do something like N7, N15 instead of R17? Er, where is... Oh, instead of R17, I see. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, that's actually what he's probing to find out right now. That's typically the purpose of playing in this particular fashion, to see how uh, white's going to respond. If, for example, white kicks, then we can go ahead and decide how to follow up, and suddenly very large area for black. We could play it immediately, um, instead of this. We could go ahead and play this immediately. Uh, that is also true. But then you might not get the approach, which is fine, which is fine. You're still going ahead and um, getting a lot of influence for this. But this is a bit more aggressive way to play, or not that. Yeah, this is a bit more of an aggressive way to play. And it's also the actual game. If instead we went ahead and saw something else, let's say... Um, I don't know, what else to say? Not many options here for 
white. I guess we could pincer, but we know that black can take the corner in sente if we pincer. If we play this, for example, we're still a little bit overextended here. Black can still come in, and our corner is probably about to disappear. So that's a bit of a problem. Um, hmm. We could ignore. That's always possible, but white uh, isn't playing a sente move at the moment. So black's just going to go ahead and follow up. Ah, wrong again. There we are. So, black plays really, really fast. I thought the rule was don't kick unless you have stone around K16. Um, that's typically the rule, yes. And if there were no other stones on the board, I would say, again, not such a great idea. But this typically gives you sente. If the board was, um, hmm, how to word this? Because, yeah, typically you're right. Unless white already has a pincer in play, we typically don't want like playing this in this particular fashion, because it's letting uh, black off way too easily. Um, we could go ahead and back off, but we know what black's about to get. And now your only choice is to kick anyway. Unless you really, really want to go ahead and try to invade this. Alright, so where was I? Right, black finish there. White follows up. Yeah, it is a very good question. It is a very good question that is true. This way, essentially, white's keeping his territory. Black's getting the top at almost any other way we play this. I mean, I guess we could try to go ahead and, like I mentioned, uh, play some sort of wide pincer. But uh, it's a little bit of a problem when we give up our corner again. At that point, the solid territory that white has is very, very slim. I mean, at that point, we can say that white has uh, some territory up in here, white has some territory down here, and we have absolutely no idea where white's territory is coming from after that. bit of a tough way of playing. Instead, he just gave Black what he wanted, kept the ter kept the upper left-hand corner, mostly for himself at the moment. I mean, there's still some invasion possibilities. But at least this way he's making some points. And he has sent to go ahead and begin reducing. Though Black decides that's actually not Sente, that I don't have to respond to that move, he goes ahead and starts turning some of his area into territory. So white follows up, as you would expect. And here's where the game turns really unlike uh, most Korean games that you're probably used to seeing. Because now that black has influence, he just keeps going after that influence. He extends, threatens to invade. He wants white to go ahead and place a stone to defend himself, so he continue building up. White instead says, no, I'm going to come in. Black says, no, you're not, I'm going to keep extending. Now he can't go past uh, this little stone. You can attach to it, I suppose, but that's only going to make it stronger. Not uh, exactly like most uh, Yi Cheng Ho games that I'm used to watching. You don't usually figure him for uh, an influence, center-oriented type of player. 
So this kind of thing is very surprising to me anyway. White keeps taking territory. Black keeps taking influence. When I said he's going after influence, he's going after that center, I wasn't lying. He's really trying to go ahead and take this for himself. On a very, very massive scale. And these kind of games are actually good for me to watch. I learn a lot from figuring out how to go ahead and even begin thinking about how to reduce all of this. Because I used to be a uh, heavily influence-oriented uh, type of player. The first two, maybe three years of my playing, I was very much into uh, influence and center moyos, things like that. So I'm still very, very weary of them, since I've used them for so long. I tend to panic. I don't know if you, uh, if you guys do. But when I see an area this large, I start getting worried. So it's very interesting to me to see uh, how a professional player is going to go ahead and look at this and decide when does he have to begin reducing it, how is he going to begin reducing it. What do you guys think? If you were faced with this, how would you begin to go ahead and look at this and decide what needs to be reduced? And how would you go about doing that? Any ideas? All right, do we have any algae calm? Uh, calm says that we have algae around N10. Uh, in terms of threatening a connection, I guess we have some Anchi there, that's true. Um, let me scroll up and see what other comments we have here. Uh, right, check the Anchi, maybe around J8, right, opening. Uh, step one is to count, that's very, very important too. That is actually step one, though... Looking for Aji and counting are very, very close together. Sometimes you don't really need to count. Sometimes an area, especially when you're dealing with center areas, look a lot larger than they are, which is why I actually stopped playing center influence and began playing more territorial. It's very, very open, easy to reduce. It's a lot harder to hold on to. I'm sure you all know that. Uh, Amy Rose is not good at reducing influence. That's okay. I'm not very great at it myself. Uh, white could start at P3. Um, close. Do you by any chance mean R3? Ah. Well, then, uh, we'll be going over that for you as well, then. Proper move is actually R3, not Q3. Or not P3. P3 actually, gr or R3 actually, uh, grants you Aji for P3. But we'll go that, we'll go through that in a second. White plays by continuing to get, uh, territory for yourself. Or himself, sorry. Nice fourth line. Making sure that this uh, stone doesn't have any Aji remaining to it. Because checking for Aji is a very good idea. And if we played something else, for example, well, we might see Black maybe just going ahead and sacrificing his stone and taking the right-hand side of the board for himself. That would be a little bit uncomfortable. That would be a little bit bad. But, again, Sente, so Black's going to go ahead and try it anyway. 
White says, no Aji for you. He replies, nice and strong, not going to leave cut points behind, because if he leaves cut points behind, you know Black's going to take him, and try to squeeze every ounce of Aji there to strengthen his position, keeping White from getting back into that middle. Probes the corner, says no connecting up. White sides to let black, uh, by doing that, white sides to let black live in the corner. Living in the corner in force is uh, Gote. So after the defense, white is free to go ahead and think about how to reduce. Yes, as Calm mentioned, since you're going to have to use Aji to get in, you should eliminate any Aji you have. That is very true. That is one very good way of looking at it. And white plops a stone as an invasion. Why? Because he's got some Aji with the Hane, he's got some Aji with linking under. The two space can practically be cut. A lot of Aji in this area. Black says, forget it. Everything over here is mine. Pokes at the cut points. Removes the cut points. Forces black to take. And goes back and tries to connect. This essentially is why it's so difficult to hold on to those uh, center areas. I mean, if there's Aji lingering, your opponent is going to stare long and hard at those points to see what he can go ahead and make work. And in this case, he's invading and attacking at the same time. That way, Black can't simply go ahead and reply by trying to kill him. He has to defend himself. The longer he's defending himself, well, that's time he's not trying to kill White or keep him from invading anywhere else. Um, white can sack e7, uh huh? I'm not sure how white would sack e17. Oh, you mean, are you expecting, I see. I see what you're. Th I see what you're thinking. I see what you're thinking. You're thinking that instead of connecting, he's gonna go ahead and try and cut through, and you're saying uh, you can ignore it to go ahead and let it die. Something like this. Hmm. Um. Very aggressive. Very aggressive. I'll grant that. But that might be a little premature. Because it's still very difficult to go ahead and connect this stone up. I mean, just because uh, E16 was played, the those stones aren't connected up. And B's corner's not alive yet by doing so. So Black's assuming this is going to result in White being completely disconnected. And hopefully at this point dead, because that corner's going to die if uh, Black loses Sente. Uh, trouble is, we still have to go back and play very, very bad shapes here. So we haven't really fixed anything. Now, I guess white could go ahead and sacrifice it, but I, I don't really see any need to. I mean, white can go ahead and connect, but that's kind of large. Keep in mind that this is still isn't completely connected up. There's still a little bit of a cut point here. So after all of that, even giving rid of our stones, we still have to go back and defend. So that's a little bit... Uh, nice to recognize that you could potentially do that. But... Black's going to simply go ahead and try to prevent those from connecting as long as possible.
So white attacks the one stone, because he would like to go ahead and cut through. So we see black defend the cut point. White has no choice but to follow up, since he can't cut anymore. Threatening to cut through. And preventing linking under. Defends himself, since he can't link under anymore. Black connects. Well, not completely connected yet. But... Almost. If white turns, chances are he's not going to go ahead and let this cut point pass just to go ahead and play L18. That'd be kind of strange. So I continue to try to make shape. Black responds. Still looking for his eyes. Connects up. Prevents him from getting cut off. Again, connects up. And still, white is not quite alive here. Now, one thing that I can point out here is that black did choose to go ahead and profit while he is attacking white. He's not solely betting everything off on the center. He is going ahead and making points on top of the board while white's struggling to live. That is always important, too. A lot of players, when dealing with center influence, they don't really take the time out to do that. They keep trying to kill whatever invasion happens to come along and run their opponent through just about everything that was trying to be theirs. And at the end, they're left with nothing, because their apparent opponent invariably lives. They didn't profit while he was living, and that's the end of the game. So here, Black is actually getting profit while he's uh, questioning whether White's alive or not. So that's very, very important to remember. Looks like White's connected. Protects his cutting point. And connects up. So once again, we have a little bit of a moyo here that's uh, growing with this framework. Up into about the center of the board. And if I'm not mistaken, this is where we go ahead and see R3. Um, yes, yes it is. Because here, white uh, has asked a very, very important question of black. Uh, can I live in your corner? If black does not want white living in the corner, you can go ahead and play here. If black doesn't mind living in the corner, he could play a move so along the lines of, let's say, maybe uh, P2. In which case, we might find something along the lines of this to go ahead and live in the corner. But Black says, no, no more living in the corner for you. You are going to die. So White changes directions and then goes hit and hits P3, which is what I thought that you were uh, questioning uh, earlier there, Ikusus. Because after your opponent's already gone to kill you, how is he going to keep this dead? Is he going to descend? Could. Certainly could descend, but then this is now Sente, because you're threatening a cut point. You can go back and say you're not going to uh, threaten that, but then there's the Ko. So. 
a lot of Aji here. Which is why R3 is very, very standard in this particular situation. Black, indeed, in the game says, no, you're not going to connect up. So white threatens to cut. Black doesn't let that happen either. But now white gets to extend it for a two-space extension, which is fairly nice. It uh, isolates K4 a bit. Granted, white is still completely surrounded. Wall here, wall up here. Not easy to live by any means. But at least K4 has to defend itself now. So it threatens to go ahead and remove the base. White simply leaves. Uh, was Q4 necessary? Alright, let's take a look at that. Um, what to do instead? Let's go ahead and, I don't know, pincer again. Make sure it can't get that two-space extension. That sounds reasonable. If we take this, the question now becomes, what's going to happen? Because those two stones are almost dead. We have to protect them. So either we're protecting them by playing the Atari this way, in which case white can now try and make um, this work. One way might try to make it work, for example, is playing, let's say, uh, the shoulder hit. Because if, white resp or if black responds, then this is suddenly a lot of forcing moves. If black responds and we continue to respond, well now it might just die. Yeah, and P2 is free as well. Which is another good point. With that dead, then suddenly, I mean that's a lot of forcing moves to go ahead and play out. You wouldn't want to go ahead and do that. And of course, in a variation like this, those stones are simply gonna get are gonna get uh, killed if he's allowed to Atari. Um, if you go ahead and play this way, same thing really. I mean, the cut's still there. You lose P two, but that's still a huge sacrifice. Lots and lots of Aji. Have to be very, very careful of that cutting point. Because even if you extend it immediately, uh, you're still working with liberty shortages. So light can begin making shape. Easiest way to make sure there's not much Aji lingering behind is to go ahead and make sure that cut point's not there. You don't have to worry about your corner. It's all nice and strong nothing to really work against. Instead, white has to make a two-space extension, which black can begin peeping at immediately, or poking at, sorry. White tries to make shape, black keeps him in. Now, if it were me, I'd be slightly uncomfortable. I do not like having to live or lose the game. That is why I don't like working with influence. Why doesn't white run toward the left? Um, you mean here? Run this way? Because of what black just threatened to do. He's threatening to go back and kill that initial invasion. Here, can no longer cut. Good question to ask, though. I completely skipped that. I'm sorry. No problem. Thanks for asking it. 
Uh, where was I? Right, so black keeps them in. White trying to use Samaji. Again, we're seeing a similar idea to what I just mentioned with uh, Q4. We see that there is this cut point that he can go through. The ladder doesn't work right now, but here he's going to attempt to make it work while poking at uh, the cut point of blacks. So he's doing two things at once. Very nice. So black responds. White continue trying to get shape. And finally he gets some. And at this point it was very, very difficult to actually kill white. Because we have to respond here. But we've got the Hane. We still have some forcing moves. He's getting a lot of area here for himself, not to mention this turn. So black decides to go ahead and make sure that he's profiting from this exchange. Oh, sorry. Uh, why Q9 rather than Q7? Alright, Q9. Alright, is... Oh, okay, here. Rather than Q7. Uh, it's still a forcing move. If black responds... Um, I already played it. If black responds, a move like Q7 or maybe Q6 is probably going to be one of the next moves played because we still have cutting points at A and B. So threatening to disconnect this is going to be Sente. Which is also why Black's making sure that he's profiting from this exchange, keep uh, making sure that he has territory. Unfortunately, White's not backing off that simply. He's going to keep attacking until he's alive. White, uh, Black has no choice but to make sure that he's alive, because again, he's got cuts. Threatens to kill. And getting shape for himself, White has... Alright, I'm back on livestream. I'll merge those two and upload it to YouTube. So white backs off, black's forced to live, to live, and it also gives uh, white enough space to go ahead and make sure that he has more than enough room for two eyes. Now that he's alive, he begins poking at black's shape. Make sure that he has his two eyes, since uh, black can't honey. Black protects. White keeps protecting. Black keeps following. I mean, free forcing moves to make sure the bottom is nice and fine. And a bit of six line territory. That's respectable. Make sure that he's nice and connected. That his stones are okay. Definitely reducing the six line territory that he just gave him. Make sure it can't expand any further. But B's Moyo did in fact get destroyed, that is true. White made two invasions, and he managed to live with both of them. That is essentially why it's very, very difficult to actually play influence-oriented games like this. Did White have to push at F5? That seems odd. Um... There's really no reason not to. If we don't push at f5, black can go ahead and extend at f5, and now it's a question of are we still connected here? If we are connected, we can play elsewhere. If we're not, this becomes a problem. Because we're getting into a lot of uh, problems with our liberties. I mean, we can go ahead and Hane, but that's no good. We can go ahead, or sorry, push through. We can go ahead and Hane this way, 
but again, liberty problems. So that's actually a very, very important defense. Because this irritating little stone is just primed to go ahead and come back and haunt us. Because we can connect, but then we're dead. And of course, if we protect that, then we're dead again. So we can't ignore this. He gets to go ahead and connect up in Sente. So instead of that, he can just go ahead, make sure he's fine, Black's got to respond, no problems with uh, our connection. Seems worth it. Uh, Calm says there seems to be a lot of nastiness around N6, he says, N6. Um, I'll show that, I suppose. Where did, uh, let's see. Yeah, black pr def uh, pr um, brings the stone back to life, but the question is, where are you going to go from here? Uh, this, I guess. This is definitely a uh, really large problem, that is true. We, there's no way to uh, say this anymore, I don't think. But there's also this, when can't really go any further anymore. So we protect, protects, and we still have our eyes. So it's a reduction, sure, but it's not going to kill anything, unfortunately. But yeah, there is, do have to be careful of that. Can't just go ahead and uh, cut through and say, haha, more stones for us, because that will, in fact, go back and kill us. That is true. Um, how much left is this game? Actually, a fair bit. We have a lot of end game. I think I'm going to go ahead and uh, stop here. It's a little bit of a hard-to-see game, I guess. I don't think you guys uh, have a clear idea of who's ahead and who's behind yet. In fact, what does the guesstimator say? Eh, guesstimator's right, but he's also wrong at the same time, so that's adorable. White is a little bit ahead. And Endgame doesn't really uh, do much to change that. So in the end, white 